Um, so just once again, thank you both for joining us today. And yeah, would you mind just sharing a little bit of info about you, your background, what you're currently doing um, before you before you lead into the presentation? That would be great. Mm -hmm. um, so, yep, I'll just do another wee thing once the presentation starts, but whilst you can see our faces. Uh, my name is Fiona Mingus. I'm an archivist. Um, I have a background in working in various projects and various institutions around Scotland. And this is Elizabeth Vandermeer. Do you want to say a wee bit more sure. about yourself? Uh, so my background is in uh, biodiversity conservation, but, but more recently in anthrozoology. So looking at human animal relationships and interactions, uh, specifically focusing on captive wild animals. So, so um, this is just a fascinating project for me. So I'm the postdoctoral researcher on the, on the project, as Fiona said. Let me just share the screen. Um, has that appeared for everyone okay? Yeah. Oh. So we're doing using incredible technology of <laughs> passing the laptop between one another um, as we discuss our own bits. Um, but yes, like I said, um, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon uh, for this One Kind Winter Warmer webinar on One Kind, A History and Future. So like I said, my name's Fiona, I'm an archivist and I'm joined by Elizabeth, who's our postdoctoral researcher on a project which is looking to make archive collections relating to animal welfare and human interaction with animals accessible to the public. Um, and that's through research, cataloguing and conservation and photography. Um, so we'll be looking at three different collections, but we will mainly be focusing on one kind and the archive and what we're doing with it. Um, so the session isn't necessarily going to be a history of the organisation, but as I say that, I go on to the next slide, hopefully. There we go. Um, so a brief history um, of one kind. Um, if you want more information on the history of one kind, there's a really useful section on the one kind website. If you go to about us and our history, there's a fantastic timeline um, all about the history from the foundation of the organization to the present day, which has helped me on more than one occasion when it comes to doing my work. But um, back in the day, uh, prior to the 20th century, it used to be part of the National Anti-Vivisection Society, which is based in London until 1911. This was when the Ivory Sisters, Netta and Elizabeth, founded the Scottish Cooperative Anti-Vivisection Society. Um, the name quickly changed uh, to the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Vivisection, uh, a name which lasted until the 1990s. So the organisation was originally set up um, to campaign for an end to vivisection. They did this through fundraising and through um, promoting. Oh. Sorry. Um, so through promotion. Um, and um, sorry about that. And um, through parliamentary work as well and getting bills pushed through parliament. Um, as time has gone on, the scope of the charity has expanded uh, to include the protection and welfare of all animals in all various um, areas of protection. And still the, to this day, one kind campaigns to end animal experimentation. Um, so you might be wondering why you have two people from the University of Edinburgh coming to talk to you about one kind. Um, that is because the One Kind Archive is housed within Heritage Collections, which is based in the main library at the Centre of Research Collections, George Square. Now, this space is where you can book an appointment in reading room to consult material, or if you want to attend events, we also have them in this space as well. Um, the One Kind sits amongst many, many, many collections, and I'm talking thousands of collections, um, some of which I've got photographs of um, here. Um, the skeleton at the side, that's William Burke. Um, you can't see him in the reading room, even if you book an appointment, but you can see him at the Anatomy Museum when it's open. Um, but also we have an incredible team here 
um, at the university, such as conservation and photography. So we've got a conservator working on the project, Amanda Dodds, and right at this moment, we've got Malcolm and George who are working on the photography of um, archive material from one kind right now, right now. Um, so the conservation team, they deal with repairing material and making sure it's stable for whether that be to consult in the reading room or for exhibition and photography that helps widen access on a more global scale so you can view um, selected items from a collection from across the world and storage wise as well um we have i think it's a couple of kilometers of shelving um and all of our stores are climate controlled and secure um which means again the material can last longer than it would in an office cupboard. Um, so like I said, um, Elizabeth and I are working on a project and one kind does not stand alone in this project. So we received funding from Wellcome Trust back in 2021 for a 30 month project, exploring archival collections relating to the concept of One Health uh, One Health being the concept, how the environment, animals and humans are all linked together and all depend on each other for their health of each individual one. You know, for example, you know, quite a popular research, quite popular research into this uh, concept is if you have deforestation, which leads, leads to closer um, habitation between animals and humans can lead to the spread of zoonotic diseases either way and thus causing pandemics. Um, there's not so much of that in this collection, but Elizabeth will give it a wee mention. So there are three collections involved in this project, which need to be catalogued, conserved and made accessible. Um, these are one kind, of course, the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland and the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies. One of the things I find really interesting about this project is the relationship between all these well, the three organisations. Um, as I say to people, the history of all these organisations has and continues to be driven by a love of animals. But they don't always see eye to eye. Um, so there is some disagreement and you can see it all through the collections they are always corresponding with each other historically and it's very fascinating. Um, but the outcome of this project is not to just have them catalogued and accessible, but we want to encourage discussion on the welfare of animals in Scotland and the wider world today. So what's in the um, One Kind archive? There is a lot. It is a really fascinating collection with a broad spectrum of topics. Um, so it's really made up of organisational papers. These could be reports, minutes, um, papers of presidents and directors, um, campaign material. These aren't just from one kind or the SSPV. These are from anti-vivisection societies, mainly in the UK, but also from around the world as well. We've got a fantastic collection of photographs, publications and some really beautiful illustrations. Um, topics that are included in the collection. Um, of course, there is vivisection and animal experimentation. I would say that is the bulk of the archive and that is made up of you know, the campaign material, parliamentary papers, photographs and so on. Um, but like I said, the organization expanded. So we also have animal welfare and cruelty documentation, um, correspondence and discussion about the welfare of animals and farming, performing animals and alternative medicine as well. I've just selected a few images from the archive here. So you can see a scrapbook dating from the 1920s and 1930s. And um, this is all about the sort of events they did, um, including the Dogs Bazaar, which is my favourite event, which is when they would raise funds um, to campaign for an end to animal experimentation by essentially renting out a big space in Edinburgh. Everyone could bring their dog and there were stalls and it was all very nice. Um, also have an example of some of the campaign material that was being published. Um, the Don't Vivisect Me poster is quite... Why Vivisect Me? I can't see the top of it. Um, 
poster is quite visceral. And you also have this interesting newspaper cutting from 1930s, um, where the Duchess of Hamilton um, spoke out against um, the use of furs as fashion. So she was calling for an end to fur and fashion in the 1930s, which is a topic I consider to be topical in the 1960s and even today. Um, but I do like what she said in her speech, which was, don't, she was wearing a fur coat at the time. Uh, she says, don't imagine this is a real fur coat. It is artificial fur. Wherever you find a real anti-vivisectionist, you will find an artificial fur coat. Um, and then we also have some, the meeting minutes of the very first meeting they had in 21st of December, 1911. So what's being done with the archive? Um, so when it came to us, it was sort of in cardboard boxes. Um, so all of that has been moved into archive standard boxes, which are acid free and neutral, um, and also with the folders as well. So anything that came in a brown brown envelope wrapped up with string is now in sort of acid free box acid free folders which make it more accessible uh, when it comes to cataloging uh, that's been my job so essentially it's been my job to read every single letter every single pamphlet every single newspaper cutting and parliamentary paper that has been processed by one kind and the sspv and make sense of it describe it and organize it. Um, so the idea of doing all of, oops, bash a table, uh, of doing all of that work is so I can create a catalog which is accessible online. So if researchers or visitors want to use anything, they can see it um, on the online catalog and they know exactly what they want to see. Um, so this is an example of what the archive catalog could look like online. I'm still tinkering about with it. So it will be published um, before March 2024. Um, I'm sure one kind will make an announcement <laughs> when it's done. I'll be sure to let them know. Um, but you can get a rough of a day of how it's set up. So you can see we've got the administrative records of the organisation. Um, those are anything that encompass all their work, their meeting minutes, their reports, etc. And their campaigns. Uh, like I said, we just started off with vivisection and we've grown since then and I fully expect one kind to continue growing and more campaigns can be added to there as history goes on. But essentially everything is selectable and can be found down to an item level. Um, there's also been a great deal of conservation work. We've had two conservators on our project, Mary Boyle and Amanda Dodds. It's been their job to fix any tears, flatten anything that needs to be flattened. Um, and they've put in fantastic effort to make the One Kind Collection sustainable. One of the things we were discussing with um, Mary uh, when she started at the, yeah, at the start of the project was the use of gelatin, which is quite often used as ad an adhesive in the world of um, conservation. And you just thought it was just wrong <laughs> to use an animal based product on an animal welfare collection. So they've been investigating cellulose based adhesives and um, Mario has said that they do work better than the gelatin. So there you go. Um, but looking to the future, um, so by the end of this project, the archive of one kind and the other organisations as well, the Royal Zoological Society and the Dick Vets, will become accessible to a much wider audience. In the in the past, you know, these haven't been catalogued. There hasn't been much access to them. But by the end of this project, we hope to turn that around. Um, with that, I'm going to I hand the computer over um, to Elizabeth, who will be able to talk to you more about what she's discovered in the archive from a research point of view. So just pass you over. Okay, thank you. All right. So yes, um, thanks everyone for being here, and a big thanks to Fiona for actually making everything accessible because it was such a huge task, and for me to come in. I, I started in October, and everything's been available for me now. I know where to find things, so thank you again. Um, so yeah, um, 
me just move on here. Yeah. So I my task was to find possible research topics or streams within uh, all three collections that kind of bound them together, um, and also to increase engagement uh, in terms of uh, researchers, other academics. Um, I've been looking at research topics from 1900 to 1970, but um, more specifically 1915 to 1965 so far. Um, so you can see uh, six streams that I've identified. Uh, the, the first uh, that I've noted is uh, exploring the development of holistic views of animal and human health across the collections, then uh, anti-science, anti-vaccination sentiment and responses to it. And this does relate to different ideas of what constitutes cruelty. Um, then there's a there could be a big project around movement of animals in zoonoses relating to colonialism, animal agriculture, and vivisection across the collections. Uh, also, women in the animal welfare movement and in science. So, giving women voice, but also understanding perceptions of women during that time period, as well as women's perceptions of themselves. Um, and finally, I've included human animal relationships in war because these collections span both world wars. Um, and you can see um, horses, dogs, and zoo animals um, as a focus. Um, and it's relevant in terms of wars that are occurring now, like in the Ukraine um, and, and Gaza. So, so I'll just now um, go through each topic that I've uh, just introduced. So in terms of holistic views of animal and and or human health, um, there's a really good example in at the Dick Vet uh, in milk fever research. So this was where um, animals were, or cows were collapsing. This was in the dairy industry. Um, and they weren't understanding why. And, and these animals were also having broken bones. And um, so by 1925, they realized that these cows had a calcium deficiency. Um, but again, they were still investigating why, and these animals were um, within industrialized farming, and that had increased in terms of how much milk production they needed to um, produce, uh, how much milk they had to produce, and then also uh, in terms of, um, you know, producing calves. So, so animals were, were going down with milk fever uh, after calving. And um, Dick Vet uh, veterinarians were investigating this and, and reaching understandings about uh, the fact that this was due to uh, hypocalcemia. And they had to start looking at these animals more holistically in terms of what they were eating, their diet, um, their environment. So what you know, what kind of grass were they eating and what nutrients did were they getting? So it was moving, you know, more from cows as machines to cows as actual um, living beings that, that need to be um, cared for beyond that mechanistic view. Um, then in one kind, you had um, these conceptions of clean living and clean and healthy living. And that was kind of pushing against uh, vac vaccination schemes. Um, so basically, you're focused more on your environment, so hygiene. You're also focused on nutrition. Um, and, and alongside that, you're looking at um, your mental well-being, but also your spiritual well-being. So um, if you're carrying out these vivisection experiments, you're, you're kind of sacrificing your soul. This is, this is what you find in, in uh, the uh, Our Fellow uh, Mortals magazine, you find a lot of references about this, which is really fascinating. And they were pushing against germ theory, which was relatively new at the time. Um, so they had this this conception of spontaneous generation, which was that um, germs appeared as a symptom of disease rather than as a cause. And that's not unusual because at that time, uh, germ theory hadn't totally caught on, especially in the 1910s and early 1920s. Um, so they're reflecting part of public sentiment about uh, germ theory, which is interesting. Um, in terms of zoo archives, there was a movement away from barred cages to naturalized enclosures. And this was, this was something that was happening across zoos um, over time. Um, and there's also an expression of health benefits of closeness to uh, wild animals in, for instance, the, the zoo magazine uh, talking about just um, this kind of sense of closeness to other animals, um, wild animals, uh, when you're watching them. Um, so, so you can see that um, there, there's either 
the existence of a holistic view or movement uh, towards one over time in the archival materials. Then, um, in terms of anti-science, anti-vaccination um, expressions and responses, uh, one kind was was clearly against objective material and brutal science, uh, ex kind of explaining that it lacks compassion and it is treating animals like machines. Um, and and I think here also, um, this is just a continuation of, in, in a way, of 19th century romantic thought, which was kind of pushing against um, the brutality of science, which, which, which it was at the time, it was quite, quite you know, quite brutal. Um, so animals were not seen as for human use. Um, and this had strong evangelical roots. Uh, you find this a lot within our, uh, our fellow mortals, um, references to uh, Christ's teachings and the fact that you're really ruining your soul if you're doing this. Um, and then the Dick Vet has, um, as Fiona said, you know, these are, they have conflicting views, but they're all coming at it in terms of, um, in some way, caring for animals or, or having animals as, you know, central to their, their mission. Um, but the Dick Vet was challenging, for instance, inconsistencies that they saw, um, perhaps, you know, anti-vivisectionists were still eating meat or they were using animal products. So, you know, why is it so wrong to, to experiment on animals if you're using animals in other ways? Um, and then they, they believe that um, there's a need for experimentation to understand, and you had to be objective and not sentimental. Um, and and this, this was linked towards a wider good, so animal sacrifice was for the wider good. Um, then if you move on to the um, zoo archives, um, zoo, Edinburgh Zoo and other zoos saw, saw animals as ambassadors that would encourage the public to care about animals broadly, not just wild animals. Um, and zoos were also seen by zoos as places of knowledge sharing and education, and the zoo is laboratory. And this is relevant because um, the zoo had a, a strong relationship with the Dick Vet, so the Dick Vet would carry out postmortems on animals that had died, and there was a learning process going on, and zoos did learn from, well, Edinburgh Zoo did learn from these postmortems in order to care for these animals better. Another big topic is um, movement of animals, and especially when you look at the uh, the zoo archives. So, so you have wild caught animals that were donated within Britain to the zoo, and then you have wild caught animals that were imported from countries like Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, India, and these this you can look at in terms of colonial history. Um, there was also a two way traffic, so you had animals going from uh, Scotland to um, African countries to India to zoos there or menageries there um, so you can think about that in terms of um, zoonotic disease um, and and also obviously welfare and how these animals fared with with the actual transport that they had to um, suffer um, then in terms of one kind uh, the SSPV records, you find traffic of cats and dogs within the UK and movement of monkeys from India to the UK and, and elsewhere for experimentation. So again, that's another stream of animals being moved around. And what does that mean for their welfare? What does that mean in terms of public health risk? Or was there even a consideration of public health, health risks? Um, and the DICVET kind of brings them together uh, through wild animal postmortems. Uh, also, in that case, contributing to health and visibility of animals and recognizing zoonoses like glanders and tuberculosis. Um, but they also had this relationship to vivisection, so they undertook vivisection, but for the benefit of other animals um, and that, you know, obviously the health and well-being of dogs and cats. Um, and they cross both collections uh, in that respect. So also, um, as I mentioned at the start, um, within the collections, you can look at women in animal advocacy and science in one kind, um, as Fiona already introduced, the Ivory Sisters, um, and also uh, Isabella Fivey Mayo was the founder and editor of Our Fellow Mortals. And I found another um, database uh, with archival material about her and other uh, Scottish uh, women writers, so we can connect to other archives which is fantastic. Um, and women were 
in Scotland and, and in, within the UK and, and in other countries, uh, this I've researched the States and France as well, and women were drivers of not only animal advocacy, but, but also other social issues. So that kind of nexus would be interesting to, to um, explore. Uh, the Dick Vet, uh, you can look at uh, first women graduates in 1948 and who undertook full degrees and received recognition. Uh, and I, I have their names uh, here. So you could profile those women and give them a voice. Uh, I don't see as much in the literature and academic literature about um, the Scottish context and women who were advocates or who were um, in the sciences. So, so I think that would be a really useful uh, stream to consider. Um, the zoo, it's a little more subtle so far because I haven't, I haven't focused enough um, but women are donating animals, they're donating money, so you can look at who they were. You can also look across these collections, as I said, uh, about uh, expressed perceptions of women in relation to animals. So there's a lot there to look at. And finally, um, and sadly, uh, animals in war. So as I said, the collections um, span both World War One and World War Two, And um, you can see, like, for instance, in uh, Our Fellow Mortals, uh, SSPV is showing animals as heroes, you know, horses and dogs in particular during war, um, rescuing soldiers or providing comfort to soldiers. And because they do that, um, it's seen that they make claims on, on us, on humans, to look after them. Um, obviously, you also see animals suffering in war alongside uh, humans, and uh, so Dick Fett, uh talks about attending to animals who are injured and ill. Um, and then also there's the issue of um, zoonotic disease transmission within that war context. Um, finally, getting to the to the zoo context, um, zoo animals deemed too dangerous, and this was legally um, an issue. Uh, so you, during war times, you weren't allowed to keep animals that were, that were dangerous, such as poison snakes, wolves. Um, so these were destroyed, and you can find uh, this in the death records of, of animals, uh, but they also protected other animals by um, they had sandbags and they would sandbag different enclosures to make sure that uh, they would survive bombings because the zoo, the zoo was actually bombed twice. So it was it was an actual threat. Um, one quick comment before we close. Um, so my um, my own research, short research project is going to be about um, bacterial infections, uh, tuberculosis and glanders specifically, and how and responses to those infections uh, across the collections. It has to be a short project because we, we finish at the end of February. Um, but yeah, that's that's a quick intro to um, possible research streams. Um, but I think that's, that's it from the two of us. I've just put up a picture of Roy. <laughs> um, Roy was the convener of the Dogs Bazaar in 1923. Each year had a, a different dog. Um, to be the promoter of each each event. Um, but we will close down the PowerPoint presentation and we are more than happy to answer any questions you might have. And yes, we're keen to hear from you. But thank you very much for thank listening. You. having a look at some of the questions in the chat. Yeah, I um, completely agree, Cynthia. Um, this is what I think is so important is looking back. You know, you can't decide the history without looking back and you can't answer questions in the future without knowing what's been said in the past, uh, which is why I think access to archives is so important and certainly in regards to transparency as well. So completely agree. And then here's one for you, uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, that's why I think I will be um, focusing more on this idea of one welfare, which which I think really captures what what you're saying there that that we're all so interconnected, and our welfare is interconnected to animal welfare, and animal welfare interconnected with our welfare. So, absolutely, yeah.
Well, thank you both. Um, could I ask a question, please? Um, a few of the One Kind team members have um, had the privilege of going to the archive um, and even helping you out with a few of the photos. So um, I wanted to ask you, um, what is your favourite piece in the archive? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I just absolutely love going through our fellow mortals because there's so much there. It's just, it's a wealth of, of information about the time period. You really get a sense of it. Like even during the war years, it's just, it's harrowing as well, you know, and, and you also get to see kind of the, the changes not only societally but but within sspv and 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 also you know it's got amazing um illustrations and you know it's just a it's a fantastic resource for researchers absolutely yeah mm -hmm. yeah i always get very distracted looking at my fellow mortals um because i've got a time limit i always just want to read every yeah. single article in the magazine uh, elizabeth gets a chance to read yes. them <laughs> i don't um but i think my favourite thing I came across um, were documents relating to Greyfriars Bobby, and particularly the 1960s Disney film. And when I came across this, I was like, oh, this is very interesting. Maybe this is looking into performing animals and the welfare of performing animals in cinema. Um, and I was wrong. Just the, the director at the time was a massive fan of Greyfriars Bobby <laughs> and had collected um, various like all the photographs from the film they're all there and even the sspv had an advert taken out in the premiere um brochure and were present when it was first premiered in edinburgh at um uh, the picture house on lothian road but i think that was my yeah my most unexpected find <laughs> that's fascinating um we've got a question here from from Libby, and it's actually the same question that I was going to ask. Um, but with regards to women donating animals to the RZSS, where did those collections come from? So it's interesting because I'm, I'm looking at arrival records for the zoo, and um, they're not totally complete what you see in these books, um, but they're definitely like individuals donating, say, um, animals who were exotic pets or, you know, so that's mainly where these donations are coming from. It's not like a, a large number of animals. It's like a, an individual single animal being donated. Um, for the most part, it seems like they were um, monkeys, uh, a, lot of, a lot of small monkeys, like capuchins or, um, yeah, or marmosets. Um, yeah, so, uh, but again, like I said, the, the records don't, don't show you a lot but you get a sense of what's being donated and yeah who who yeah who's you, you have to do a bit of research to understand who the person is who's donating i hope that answers it your question does does for me thank um, you thank you no i think it was absolutely fast absolutely fascinating it's so interesting to see and i think there was a comment earlier um, in the chat, which I absolutely agree with, that we have to look back at all the things that's happened just to appreciate that there is progress and there is, um, you know, change. We have to, you know, sometimes it can be a hard, a hard slog in the type of work that we do. Things can span decades before we see change. So it, it is really good to look back on progress. Um, another question I had just before I forget, um, you mentioned that the plant-based adhesive alternative um, was used in our collection, um, which is which was amazing, um, and also commented that they seemed to work better. So I wondered if there was any plans to roll that out onto future collections, or if that would be something that would you know be used in in future. Yeah, I don't see why not. I don't think there's just a growing awareness um, through the industry um, that cellulose is an option. Um, I think one of our conservators said it's less shiny <laughs> or more shiny. There was something more appealing about it. <laughs> it's, it's a gelatin. Um, but yeah, I, I think certainly even when it comes to exhibition displays, it's more of a focus on sustainability and avoidance of um, single use plastics. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think generally it is going towards more plant based and more sustainable practice. Amazing. Um, we've got a question here from Kim um, asking, how can we convince today's campaigners of the importance of preserving their animal rights work? 
Oh, I mean, I think looking at the the one kind collection is is a good place to start. Um, because yeah, I can't speak for those who work at one kind. Um, but certainly when they've come in to engage with the archive, oh, Bob can say something. <laughs> yeah, no, I was sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you uh, at all, uh, but uh, you're quite right. Basically, I'm just going to back up what you're saying. Going in there and seeing our collection was quite a, you know, I don't know, emotional sort of moment, really. I mean, wearing, you know, protective gloves and handling things that were probably in the back of a filing cabinet once upon a time. So learning that how we, on a day-to-day -day basis, perhaps think about the future and what might be entering the uh, archive is really important. And I was going to ask later, but I bet you guys smile every now and again when you see us, you know, talking about pandas that are going back to China and there's us, you know, the zoo and us at it again, you know, and talking about these issues. But no, what I wanted to say was thank you so much for your work. And having that resource is just going to be so brilliant from for all sorts of reasons. Mm. And we can relate back to our history of far far more um, coherent way ourselves so we can improve the website we can link really well with it it's not just a load of papers that we should have probably kept in a better condition sorry about that <laughs> well, yeah I was gonna say because you can really see like the solidity of mission you know within your organization um, and or and you can see the changes you know changes in why uh, like for instance the evangelical Christian, um, position at the start, you know, um, but I think that was an amazing, amazing impetus for uh, protect animal protection, you know, the way it's explained, it's, you know, it's just, it's really interesting. Um, but I would also say, um, just, just so you know, we have had a lot of interest from academics um, who want to engage, like even within English literature, with the, um, our fellow uh, mortals magazines, because they're looking at, um, argument and, and, you know, how these, um, how uh, SSPV is representing issues and, and even through imagery. Uh, so it's, so yeah, we've, we've had a lot of interest, not only from the vet school and health and social sciences, but other areas, environmental humanities. So yeah, it's really good. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, leap in here and add a few comments? I mean, it's an excellent presentation. Fantastic work. I'm so pleased to see it. Um, and I would love one day to be able to come and visit and have a look. Um, with my work with the British Library, which preserved my archive, there was a phrase that I learned from them, which was called born digital. And these are files created electronically, which is increasingly how things are done nowadays. Mm -hmm. And and born digital uh, whilst it's, uh, it's you know working digitally is a, is a blessing and a curse in many respects, it also means that stuff that are the drafts that lead to final documents aren't preserved and uh, they're just not kept. And I think further to the question about what can we do to encourage all, today's campaigners of the importance of the, understanding the history and preserving their activities is that it would be great if if um, one kind could organize some way of reaching out and, and and using you as an example to show other organizations why this is important and particularly at the time of of digital records because if we don't preserve um the born digital materials they won't be preserved they just won't be preserved and it's bad enough trying to preserve paper records, let, let alone electronic records. So I really encourage you to, to think about doing some proactive thing. And I would be very happy to work with you to, to do this. And I know that my colleagues and Vanessa, I see here from TM Rect, will be very happy to work with you on, on, on net. We have a network of animal libraries, a network website, so that we can collaborate together on preserving the history of the movement and preserving the history of animal rights. And I'm so pleased to hear you're saying that academics are coming to you to using the uh, archive. It's the emergence of animal studies and literature and history and so on that is helping to sh throw light on understanding why we have such a confused and contradictory relationship with animals. So just to sort of stop here, I just want to thank you again and really congratulate you on what you're doing. 
and just try and encourage as many animal groups as you can in Scotland and in the UK and elsewhere to follow the lead that you've set. Mm -hmm. I Thank mean, you. yeah, I mean, further on, you know, once this project is over, we have a web and digital archivist um, here. Um, I am very intimidated by the world of digital archives, um, mm -hmm. which is why we have specialists um, on site to deal with it. Um, but certainly when it comes to preserving um, websites for example we can capture the different the history of different websites um, i do believe they have a way to sort of go back to certain drafts of documentation um, this is out of my skill set but there is a skill set within the center of research um, research collections who can handle that yeah really important point mm -hmm. Hi, Sean. I see Sean has a hand raised. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, but to, uh, I'm Sean uh, Wensley. I work at PDSA, uh, oh. another old charity. Um, we were founded in 1917. Um, I'm just actually rereading uh, our founder's memoir, uh, The Cry of the Wild, at the moment. So this is brilliantly <laughs> timed webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I was going to ask you, A, if you had any um, plans to do it for other charities, you may have hinted that you do. So I, I'd be fascinated to see. Well, actually, I must find out what's been done at PDSA because I know there is an archive mm. and, uh, you know, I, could, I probably can't don't appreciate the full extent of the extent uh, to which it's been mined and uh, explored already. And just on the, um, more specifically, the, the, uh, the role of animals in war, uh, we still have an active medals program oh. um the, the dickin medal and the gold medal mm. and a big strand of our charity still does look at celebrating that role of animals in, in war but yeah. i just wondered if you had any reflections on how it sits with the evolving animal advocacy role and whether that's something that one kind used to champion and does so less now or that for me personally it feels a little bit incongruous um but equally it would be a large part of the charity to you know, significant strand of the charity's work to at all downplay or roll back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this project is funded by the Wellcome Trust and it's part of a larger thing looking at you know, the relationship between animals and humans and animal welfare in Scotland from the mid 19th century to the to the present day. Um, but it's yeah, a matter of getting funding and an organisation to take the record as well. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly the British Library had an amazing exhibition earlier this year on animals and really balanced that out with their animal welfare um, records as well. Um, but yeah, it's mainly approaching funders and really mm -hmm. drumming how much can come out of it. It's not just for, you know, the administration of the organisation. Yeah, yeah, it's so much research had come out i mean elizabeth's doing such amazing work um finding all different pathways um which i i wouldn't know about um but yes it's, it's finding funding um to get someone in to mm -hmm. to catalog things and i mean i don't know bob if you wanted to step in but but in terms of what i've seen um with SSPV, they're, they're not advocating animals in war, but they're saying, look, these animals are, were used in war like horses and, you know, dogs, even cats in the trenches, you know, in World War One. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's more that, you know, this is happening. Um, and, and these animals have been what, what they, they've called heroes within this context. And we really owe them because of their, their, their service to us, you know, so we need to treat them in a particular way. So, so that's really what, what I'm seeing. Um, not, not an advocacy for, you know, animals being, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, the, uh, the, what we're looking at is the historical record. So yes. of course now we'd be like, I know we said up in arms, but we'd be really, concerned and we are really concerned with with animals that are caught up in war situations and they could be companion animals right now um it's a difficult one sometimes because you know lots of people are dying and having that sort of campaigning sort of uh, thrust can be can be um badly managed if you don't get it right but yeah um 
I mean, I, I think it's it, it sort of then it was celebrated that animals were, were being used by humans for humans ends. And I would argue now that perhaps uh, it's a bit less celebratory. I just feel a bit sorry for them now. But yeah, that was that was then and that horses were used regularly in wartime situations. So now we wouldn't be doing that now. Mm -hmm. um, but good point, though. Yeah. I, just, I just want to bring back to one of the pictures Elizabeth had up earlier of the cover of My Fellow Mortals, and I'm just remembering the, the caption for the image of a soldier looking down at a, a dead dog mm -hmm. in the trenches and saying, not mentioned in the morning dispatch. And I think that brings attention to that they were looking at the tragedy of, of the animals that were being killed and how yeah. they weren't acknowledged. Yes, exactly. Yeah. They're trying to, to give that acknowledgement. To these animals yeah. yeah exactly there was they were given no choice as well yeah. you know they were obviously being trained to do this and and uh yeah but that's right um it was heart-wrenching isn't it heart-wrenching to read those passages fiona mm -hmm. and those of us does anybody else have any questions no if anyone thinks of anything after the session, I know sometimes it can be difficult to think at the time because we're just so engrossed in listening to what you're saying. Um, I, for one, am that type of person. So if anyone does have any sort of questions that they suddenly think of later while making their tea, please feel free to drop us an email at one kind and um, we'll be sure to find the answers for you. And we can contact Fiona and Elizabeth afterwards. Um, but what a fascinating presentation. Thank you so much. What, interesting work you're both doing and really important work I think we all take that away that it's really important to keep records and sort of make sure that all of those are preserved because at one point you know what we're doing now also needs to be catalogued and so that we can look at that progress and see how we've evolved and keep going keep striving forward but the work that you're doing is is amazing so and thank you so much for doing that on behalf of one kind I know that the team are all really really grateful for your hard work and in, in looking after that for us um I have also popped the link to our history timeline which you mentioned earlier I also refer to it a lot myself <laughs> I know we all have when we're looking back on things or what did we do then or what did you know how what what was happening at that time um, so I've popped a link in there um, if anybody wants to have a look at that. It's really interesting. And yeah, just thank you so much both, to both of you for taking the time this afternoon. Um, no, no, thank I you. Really appreciate thank it. You. Perfect. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. And yeah, just thank you so much to everyone for attending and for taking the time out to, to yeah join us this afternoon. We're really grateful and hope you all enjoyed the session. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.